if you turn with me to Daniel chapter 3, Daniel chapter 3 and verse 16, um, yeah, 16 through 19. When you have it or when you see it, just let me know by saying amen. amen. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach this morning probably one of my favorite uh, portions in, in the scripture, and um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach it to me, amen? So if if you don't find anything and any value in it, just come back next week and I'll try to do a better job. But I'm, I'm going to preach this one to me and, and hopefully you'll find something out of it too. Daniel chapter 3 and verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. Whew, that's a whole message for another day. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will, he will rescue us from your power, your majesty. The King James Version says, but if not, the Louis Levin translation says, but even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that his face became distorted with rage. And he commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than, than usual. I will tell you that there is a, an incredible benefit of studying the Word of God. We have gotten to the point, and I say this often, and I'm not trying to throw shade at anyone or try to make anyone feel uncomfortable, but devotions are great. Desk calendars are great. People's interpretations are great. Books are great. But there is something incredibly powerful when you begin to read the word of God for yourself. Amen. Something illuminates off the page that you will see for yourself. I, I love interpretations and I love people's takes and I love this dissertation even. I love when people begin to take something out of the word of God and begin to portray it and present it. You're like, oh man, that's really, really good. But can I tell you, you'll have those same epiphanies for yourself when you begin to unpack the word of God for yourself. God will illuminate things in your own life and you'll have these epiphany moments and say, oh my God, that was pretty good. I've never seen that before. Uh, uh, this person never, never brought it out that way, amen? It's something powerful when you begin to study the Word of God for yourself. I believe it's food for our souls. In a day where we are so experience-driven, the Word of God speaks to us with clarity. There's nothing else that can speak so clearly to, to us when we need to hear it the most. That is because the Word of God has some characteristics about it that no other book has. It is infallible. That means it is, imper that it, it is perfect, it is infallible, it has, no, it has no imperfection in it. It is inerrant, that means that there are no errors in it. It is complete. I believe that this means that we do not need anything else, extra revelation or another book and so forth. It is authoritative. This means that the word of God is final. I cannot put my own spin on it, my own justification or my own revelation on it. It is sufficient book. It has the ability to, 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 to provide and, 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 to, and to uplift and to give us what we need. And so we read the book of war, the Word of God. We read this book systematically and devotionally and topically and in corporate places of worship. There are great things that are added to the soul when we read it. Anytime that I look to God's Word, there are things that He adds to me. And in Daniel chapter 3, there's no guessing this morning. The message that I'm going to read to us and portray to us and present to us. The Bible story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is alive and well for us today, probably more so than ever before. The Babylonian way has always been the arch enemy of God's people throughout man's existence. At the time of Daniel's writing, the city of Babylon had reached the height of its glory in the reign of Nebuchadnezzar about 600 years before Christ. He made the city splendid with canals and temples and palaces and famous streets such as the processional and fortifications such as the Ishtar Gate and of course the hanging gardens which were on the seven wonders of the ancient world. And the key to Babylonian worship has always been the exaltation of the individual to become his own God. The very word of Babel means the gate of God. And this is what these first Babylonian citizens of Genesis 11 and 1 through 9 were trying to build when they constructed the famous tower. 
It was an easier man-made way to get to God. We know that God brought confusion to the languages in order to scatter them, but the Babylonian way has been working feverishly to reunify itself against God and its people ever since. Both the political and religious aspects of Babylonian worship will continue to war against the true people of God until the world government and the world church are defeated by God. And this text that we read this morning it's perhaps one of the most familiar texts in all of Scripture. It tells the story of Daniel's friends, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they refused to bow down to the image that Nebuchadnezzar had put up. There had something that gotten into their hearts that would not allow them to bow. And it was an incredible uh, understanding and revelation that we see these three young men had about them. The background is very simple. This chapter comes on the heels of Daniel's warning to Nebuchadnezzar. That Nebuchadnezzar had been warned that Jehovah would judge and destroy his empire, but apparently this king had forgotten that very quickly. So he builds this statue covered with gold so that his subjects and everybody that was under his leadership could bow down and worship it. Be very careful that you'd follow people that ultimately exalt God and not things that they've created. I'll go there. If we're not careful, we'll find ourselves following people that create books, that create stuff, that create movies, that create content, that create, uh, 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 it could be even things of, 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 of the Christian world. We, we follow people that have very creative abilities and we, and we get disillusioned about what they've created. Man, they created this great Bible study. They've created this great word. Man, they created this great movie. They've, they've created something. But we be careful that we create the thing that ultimately will cause us to look toward the creator. It can't be about what we fashion in our own hands, but it must always point back to Jesus. Amen? Nebuchadnezzar creates something so that everybody that was underneath him could bow down and worship it. His kingdom was well structured. He had organization in his kingdom. Daniel chapter 3 and verse 3 says, Then the princes and the governors and the captains and the judges and the treasurers and the counselors and the sheriffs and all the rulers. He had, a, he had, a, he had an organizational structure. He had, he had an org chart that worked, guys. Were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And in an effort to add to it, to a sense of decorum and worship, Nebuchadnezzar also added a great company of music. If I say music, I'm going to go there. Just give me five seconds. There are six different instruments noted in Daniel 3 and 5, but there are many beyond it because of the addition of all kinds of music. And nearby was already the roar of the furnace for those who refused to bow. Just a brief rabbit trail, if I may, this morning. I want to mention to you that there are parallels between Daniel 3 and Revelation 13. The final Babylonian dictator, the Antichrist, will attempt to enforce idolatrous worship on all those beneath him, imposing a death penalty for those who refuse to give him their allegiance. He renews the number six in connection with that worship. And you will notice a call to the tribulation saints to resist the idolatrous worship and even risk death to be delivered from the eternal death. It is all about Worship. Let me tell you something real quickly. It is all about worship. Our worship is either going to be heavenly or hellish. I will tell you that it has become unbelievably mainstream now that a lot of our music producers and music idols and musical artists are embracing satanic imagery uh, in, an, in a way that we never thought we would ever see portrayed, especially in public. We find the Grammys, we find the Super Bowl, we find award shows where we, we would sit there and we would say, hey, this person's getting an award about how, what a movie they made. And all of a sudden we have satanic imagery being portrayed to us through music. Over and over and over and over. I can name this one and that one and that one. And I almost brought pictures today to show you pictures of that artist and pictures of this artist. But I was like, no, I don't even want that place to desecrate the house of God. I'll just tell you, if you want to go look it up, you're more than welcome to look it up if you don't believe me. But why? 
Why is it about music? Why is the satanic imagery rooted in music right now? Because I can tell you that he was the minister of music. He was over the worship, and he wants the people of this world to worship him. He doesn't want us worshiping him. He wants us to worship the thing that he created and the person that he is. And can I tell you that even in today's society, in 2024, we are facing the same things that these three Hebrew boys faced. Except it's not a fiery furnace of literal means, but it's a fiery furnace of contempt of ridicule, of mockery. And I can tell you today that there needs to be a remnant of people that will refuse to bow down to the things that are hellish. Amen? I read an article that says the satanic panic is back. How a bygone moral crisis has returned with LGBTQ artists in its crosshairs. The satanic panic is back. Because if you will look and you will see that there's an alternative lifestyle that seems to be the common thread to those that are using satanic imagery in their music. Okay. You will be ridiculed very, very soon if you say anything about Satan or its artists or its worshipers. But I believe that there's a remnant. I believe that there's more than two or three. I believe there's a group of people that says, hey, I'm not bowing down to culture. I'm not bowing down to this. I'm going to worship the one true God. Amen? He will always have a few faithful. He will always have a remnant that refuses to bow down to the demands of worship, whether it be in 2024 or in the Babylonian age. They're often in the minority. And they will often have to stand against even their own families and friends because they are folding under the pressure. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would not bow because joining the crowd around the image would have violated the first two of the Ten Commandments given to them by God. Exodus 20 and 2. I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. You must not have any other God but me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or any image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of your parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Jesus called it the first, the preeminent, the chief principal commandment in Mark 12. 12 and 29 and Jesus answered him the first of all the commandments is hear O Israel the Lord our God is one Lord and we must worship him and him alone this morning let's give the Lord a cup of praise today I'm not worshiping them but you're listening to them you're giving your ear to them. You're giving your eyes to them. You're allowing your children to be influenced by them. What bigger worship could you possibly give than to sacrifice your children to their agenda? Is this, is this too bad? Is, it, is this going to wind me up? Is this, is, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, death was staring them in the face. But he said, I can't not do this. I can't do this. Their peers said that they were stubborn and stupid for not conforming and not compromising. But he said, I, there's something inside of me that won't let me bow. I, 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 I just can't. I, I don't know what it is. It, it don't bend that way. I can't. My back's hurt. I don't know what it is. I can't do it. Everyone is watching you, and you will not escape the fire. There's a big furnace over there. They're going to they're gonna throw you in the fire, big boy. I, well, let, let it rip, tater chip, because I, I, can't, I can't bow, baby. I, there's something about me that won't let me do it. You're trading off your high office, your royal favor, and even your life for the sake of Jehovah. 
It just did not compute with some. You see, they were not the only Jewish captives in this area. You would think that the three Hebrew boys were the only one that were Hebrew. No. There were other Hebrews in the crowd. There were others that heard the same Hero is the Lord our God is one Lord mantra every night. But it didn't resonate with them like it did with these three. But even though others bowed all around them, they stood tall and alone. Everybody else is doing it, mama. Everybody else is doing it. Why can't I do it? It's not that big a deal. My heart's right. This is what we have to understand. There will always be some who see the real value of the soul and refuse to trade the shallow things of this life for the greater value of the one to come. A.W. Tozer wrote many, many years ago that there are some marks of a spiritual person. A spiritual person has a prevailing desire to be holy rather than to be happy. A spiritual person wants to be holy rather than happy. Ouch. A spiritual person has a desire to see the honor of God advance in his life, even if it means that he may have to suffer temporary dishonor and loss. A spiritual person wants to carry the cross. A spiritual person sees everything from God's viewpoint. A spiritual person would rather die right than live wrong. A spiritual person desires to see others advance at his expense. But when you don't bow, folks, you stand out. <laughs> and many of us will bow because we don't want to stand out. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could have said, well, we'll just confirm outwardly. We will just bow with our bodies, but continue to serve God in our hearts. That way, I can prevail and, and protect my life. After all, it's just the heart that matters. But they knew that attitude would not please God. The weapon of this world is no longer cruelty but contempt, no longer torture but ridicule. You understand it was not Nebuchadnezzar who noticed them standing. I'm going to get here in just a minute. Nebuchadnezzar didn't see them. Man, where are them suckers at? I, I see somebody. There's three of them right there. Go get them. He didn't do that. King Nebuchadnezzar didn't see them. You know how he found out? There were other people. Hey, why aren't you bowing? We supposed to bow. You ain't gonna bow. <laughs> oh boy, you gonna be in trouble. And then, ha! I know what I'll do. Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> the king's royal tattletales ran to the king and said, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, there are a certain number of Jews that refuse to bow. You understand that the people that should have joined them in standing for what is right and standing for the truth and standing for what God had placed in their hearts were the very ones that went and tried to make sure that they got in trouble because they had already chosen the path of compromise. Be careful that the very people you've linked with hasn't already chosen to compromise in their own spirit. And so they ran to Nebuchadnezzar. Say, Nebuchadnezzar, he ain't bowing. So Nebuchadnezzar got mad. He got super salty. The Bible says he went out of his mind with fury. I'm, I'm so angry. How dare they? How dare they insult me? This thing about worship is serious business. The devil doesn't like it one bit when you refuse to worship the object of his kingdom and you choose to worship those of the Lord. That is why you need to let your worship be directed Godward and not earthward. And three of these boys refused to bow. I will tell you that there was a mistake that hell made that day. He allowed them some unity. He allowed them to get together. He allowed three of them to stand arm in arm together. 
Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together, together in unity. Can I tell you that the first thing that the enemy will try to do to you in your life is to separate you from people that can bring you to a place of victory. He wants to separate you from the herd. He wants to isolate you. He wants to get in the middle of everything. You, he wants to bring disunity in the house. Amen. For there where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. The devil doesn't care how much we preach, just don't let us get together. He don't care how much we sing, just don't let us be together. He don't care how anointed we are, just don't get unified. He don't care how much doctrine we have, don't care how much prayer we have, don't care how much our structure we have, just don't let us be unified. The devil don't care how many are here even. Just don't let them get behind a singular purpose and a singular cause. Because on that day, three men, three men who got together ended up ruling that day. You need to know unequivocally when two or three are together in his name, not in a narrative, not in what they want, but in his name, Somebody else will show up on their behalf. Somebody else is going to begin to become in the midst of their fire. Can I tell you today that you're in the right place? You really want to worship, but you're suffocated by a grudge you may have against somebody. You really want to shout to the Lord, but your voice is silent because you won't simply have a change of your own heart. You really would like to pat your foot or shake your foot or do a hokey pokey with something. But you can't because you can't get it together with your brother or with your sister. So the devil tells you to sit there and act dead because you truly at this moment are dead. But can you ever get to the point that I pursue restoration and reconciliation so that I can walk in unity with my brother and we can stand firm in the face of every situation and circumstance and say, hey, I don't care what you do, devil. I'm not bowing. I'm not compromising. I'm not sacrificing me or my family for for the whims of the world. Do you know what it caused you to like a spirit-filled church the first time you walked in? It was the freshness of freedom that you felt. It was a stirring down deep in your soul. You didn't have to worry about somebody shutting you up. You said amen. You didn't have to worry about an usher coming by and taking you outside because you were dancing in the spirit. But now the king of this world says, don't you do it. Don't you, don't you dare. Don't you dare raise your hand. You know you wasn't taught that way. You know, if your grandmama will see you, oh my goodness. Don't you dare do it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, oh Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. I'm tired of defending. If you're going to throw me into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power and majesty, but even if he don't, make it very clear to you we're not going to serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you set up you're going to have to learn how to worship through the midst of ridicule david said let everything that hath breath praise the lord he was a little radical y'all remember david he was in the streets escorting the ark back to the tabernacle he was dancing a little bit and guess what was happening there was somebody that was an idol was an idol worshiper that came from a lineage of idol worshipers that was watching him from her bedroom window. He was married to her. It was his wife. And she mocked him in his worship because at, in that moment she had to make a decision. I've been taught to idol worship and he's not worshiping anything but God. Now I have to make a choice. Will I link up with him or will I choose to be an idol worshiper? She says, oh, how dignified you look today, Liam. How impressive and important you looked out there dancing. She mocked him. She made fun of him. And she ridiculed him. But did anybody know what happened to her? God dealt harshly with her. She no longer could bear children. And all of a sudden, the very person that was worshiping was leaked up with someone that could not birth anything because of their ridicule of his worship. Be careful that you don't ridicule others' worship lest you become barren in your own spirit. It will cause you to dry up spiritually. It will cause your spiritual womb to be barren. There are some that here today maybe who have allowed an image to be set up in their life that they are bowing down to. You have to defeat that spirit today. Quit saying that, well, that's just not my style. I'm just not very demonstrative. 
Okay. Let's go to a ball game. Let, let your kid score a hat trick on the soccer field. I'm doing cartwheels down the sideline. They call, is, it side, is it called a sideline in soccer? It's a sideline, right? Okay. I don't know. Can I tell you your worship is not for you? It's not for anyone beside you. Your worship is for him and a realization of what he's done for you. It comes from a place of thanksgiving. It comes from a place of great gratitude and graciousness and gratefulness. It's for the King of Kings. It's for the Lord of Lords. It's for the mighty Jesus Christ, the Messiah that hung on a cross that I may live. It's for him. It's not about anybody else other than him. Nebuchadnezzar's image wants you quiet because God inhabits the what? The praises of his people, and he knows that that is a key to our success. I'm almost done. I can tell you if, you, if you're subject to a Nebuchadnezzar spirit, it's when the Holy Spirit begins to move, you feel a tightening down. Right when you feel like breaking out, a hindering spirit shuts you down. When you feel like standing up and worshiping, you feel a tense spirit pulling you right back to your chair. When you feel like raising your hands, you get about that high. You feel something squeezing on you. I can't do it. You have to understand that the climate of Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom does not like worship being directed Godward because God's worship loosens its grip that he has on you. I'm coming. Paul and Silas had the very same thing that happened to them in Acts chapter 16. They were accused, maligned, beaten, and thrown into jail. They were in pain, and Nebuchadnezzar's image had time warped now to a Philippian jail. But at midnight, they prayed and sang praises to the Lord. There's something that happens that when opportunities meet a worship, God becomes in the midst. Paul and, Pilate, Paul and Silas, they said, these men do exceedingly trouble our city. Can I tell you the church needs to exceedingly trouble our city? Can I just tell you that the worship in this place needs to exceedingly trouble every demonic spirit over our city, everything that's holding this city captive, everything that's holding our community. Can we say that the worship in here begins to shake the very jail cells of our city, of everything that's holding this place captive? They had pain from their beaten backs. They had a position in a dark jail. Their hands and feet were bound by iron. Their reputation was now torn in shreds by uncaring tongues. If you're waiting to get a perfect set of circumstances to worship, it will never take place. But I'm going to hit it again. One of the biggest mistakes the devil ever made was when he allowed Paul and Silas to be in prison together. Jesus already said when two or three agree together, you better look out. And I'm just, just hanging here just for a minute. If they would have put Paul in the same cell with Herkeldorf, you know Herkeldorf. Mr. Herkeldorf wants to criticize and find fault with everything. Herkeldorf will find fault with the church, finds fault with the preacher, finds fault with the youth group, finds fault with the parking lot team, finds fault with the music. It's too loud. It's not loud enough. Finds fault with the carpet, finds faults with the way the grass is cut. Herkeldorf. If Paul would have been linked up with Herkeldorf, do you think his miracle would have happened? No, he was linked up with somebody that says, hey, I'm not looking around me right now. I'm not worried about what you're doing or what he's doing or what she's doing or what they ain't doing. I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about who God is for me. And I'm going to sing and I'm going to worship and I'm going to praise. And all of a sudden when they begin to worship together, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I will become in the midst of them. And all of a sudden the jail cell begin to rattle and their shackles and their chains begin to fall off. Why? Because they understood the power of a worship. They understood the power of speaking the truth over an unkind situation. It would have been a disaster for Paul, but thank God he had a Silas. They were both in prison. They were both shackled, but they were both on fire for God. Thank you, Lord. You, you have some here who learn to or yearn and longing to be set free. Worship together. Worship again, mother. Worship again, father. Worship again, young person. Praise him. Lynn, if you'll come. What do you do when you see people around you falling down to worship an idol? What do you do when you see people who are once held strong begin to bow? What do you do when you see people who are once faithful give in to the enemy of their soul? 
What do you do when there's fear in your heart and you're alone with your convictions? I have a feeling that fear gripped these young men to their core. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I'm just, just hung hang on. Nebuchadnezzar was so mad. He said, y'all, y'all turn that dial up seven times hotter. That would have been enough to me like, hey, whoa, 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 wait. I was cool just a minute ago. I was, I was ready to face, face that thing. Whatever, I was ready to walk through my tribulation. I'm good. I, I, was, I was all confident. I was all ready, ready to show how and show how good God is. And I was, ready to, I, was ready to, I was ready to be about it. And then you turn it up seven times hotter. Man, what? Come on, man. You come to church and you think you get deliverance. And you think God's all about you, and you, you walk out of here, and you're, man, you're ready to face hell, and you're ready to, man, you're ready to, ready to storm hell's gate with a water pistol. Man, I'm ready. I'm, I'm, I'm going I'm to put out hell with a water gun. I'm, I'm, I'm on fire for God. I'm ready to roll, baby. And then Monday morning hits, and then Tuesday hits, and then Wednesday hits, and you realize that it's seven times harder than you thought it was going to be. And the Bible tells us that the the two guards that go to throw the three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace, that the fire was so hot that when they threw these three in, the two guards were consumed. Now hold on, y'all got to catch this. Before they walked into their trial, God was already showing them his delivering power. Well, if you catch it where do the two guards get burnt up at on the outside of the furnace Come on. and God was saying hey look I know you're about to go through some fear I know you're about to go through some trepidation but on the way before you even get into it if you will look around you you will notice that I've got this thing all under control I've got this thing all figured out. Can you imagine when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, pretty gruesome event. Oh, did y'all see them? They just got, they just got messed up, man. I'm still good. Wait, Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. They are humanity just like I'm humanity. But they didn't have a covering like I had a covering. You see, they, 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 were, they were flesh and bones just like I'm flesh and bones. But they didn't have a supernatural covering over their life like you and I have, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And all of a sudden, I can imagine them looking at each other going, oh, what is going on? And the Bible says they go in and they're... Their hands and their feet are bound by ropes. And ropes are combustible, just like the ropes can be burnt up, just like flesh can be burnt up. And the Bible says that the, that the ropes began to become burnt off of them. Little clue number two. You see, when you're in the midst of your storm, you're in the midst of your circumstance, God will begin to reveal some little things to you if you won't miss them. If you won't miss them, it will become a faith-burning moment for you. You will look down and say, oh my God, I'm in the midst of a fiery furnace. But I look down and my chains and my shackles and and my robes are being burned off of me. And all of a sudden now, the circumstance hasn't truly changed. The thing hasn't turned around yet. But God has given you little glimpses of, hey, if you'll just hang on, honey, I'm about to be in the midst of this thing with you. If you'll just hang on, we're going to walk out of this thing together. I'm going to take you through this. If I brought you to it, I'll take you through it. Just hang in here. Just don't lose faith. Just don't lose confidence. I've got everything. I got you in the palm of my hand. And so they look around, and now, they're, now, they're, now, they're, now their ropes are burned off. Can you imagine? It was hot enough to burn the rope, but not hot enough to burn the skin. Almost like they had a covering. Almost like they were anointed. Almost like you can touch everything else, but you can't touch the anointed. You, you, good God Almighty. 
And all of a sudden, Nebuchadnezzar has a revelation. He said, hold on. Hold on. One, two, three. Go there, I'll preach it before you know where I'm headed. One, two, three. Y'all, hold on. Something, something ain't right. I, how many we throw in there? We threw three. But why do I see four? Why do I see four? And the fourth looks like the Son of Man. Why do I see the fourth one walking around in a fire that was so hot that it ter that terminated the very guards that threw him in? Why? Why? Because there is something powerful about a covering that comes when we worship. There is something powerful when you begin to saturate your family with worship and you saturate your kids and you saturate your marriage and you put a covering over your family and your grandbabies and your great grandbabies babies you say God I'm covering this thing with an unbelievable worship let's all stand today something happens something supernatural happens when you cover some things with worship you begin to talk to your friends and they say oh my god you went through what oh that took me out you went through that? You had that happen to you? You went through that? You were falsely accused, you went through that? That happened and yet you're still standing? And you didn't capitulate, you didn't compromise, you didn't bow down to your own flesh and your own want to get revenge. You, you, didn't, you didn't bow, man. You didn't bow down. Mm -mm, no because I knew if I stayed the course that there would be a fourth man in my fire and that when I come out of this thing that God is going to do exceedingly abundantly more than I could ever ask or think. I'm going to close. I'm not, I'm going to, I'm not even going to finish. I'm going to close. Here, here's, here's, here's the good part. Here's the good part. This, this ought to give us all some, some, some confidence and joy. Ashton don't like to go to barbecue places. Why, Ashton? Why can't we go to barbecue places? It makes your hair smell. She don't, I like brisket, baby, but I can't go to barbecue places because of the smoke and the way it smells and she gets back in the car and it don't smell, it smell right. It's probably my message, just hang on. And that was just from smoking some brisket. But this furnace had been raging for days. It was hot. It was smoky. It was an inferno. It had already consumed human flesh. And I'm not trying to be gross, but it don't, that don't smell. Mm -mm. Burnt hair, I, mm -mm. no. It stunk. But when the three Hebrew boys come out, at the request of the king, because the king said, you must truly serve a one true God. You must truly be servants of the one true God. Y'all come up out of there. And when they came up out of there, the Bible says not even the stench of smoke was left on their clothes. When God brings you to it, he brings you through it. And when he brings you through it, ain't gonna, no mess going to be left on you. Ain't no junk going to be left on you. I don't care what they say. I don't care the narrative. I don't care the accusation. I don't care the lie. It don't matter when you come through it when you get on the other side of it everybody's gonna say hey there was something different about his anointing there was something different about his covering because not even the stench of the accusation or the trial or the tribulation will be left on you can somebody give the Lord a hand of praise this morning there's a fourth man in your fire today there's a fourth man in your fire today. There's a fourth man in your fire. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're facing today, but can I tell you that it will not deter your destiny. You will not be consumed by your trial. You will not be consumed by your test, but God will bring you through the other side, perfect and well able to give him all the glory and praise for his delivering power. Amen. Amen.
Hopefully I've given somebody some courage this morning. And in just a moment, we're going to sing. And I don't know what you're going through, but I, I, if, I was, if I've been doing this a day, I've been doing it 20-something years, I guarantee there's somebody in this room today that's going through some mess, that's going through some stuff, and you don't know which way to go, and you don't know up from down. Flames all look the same. The fire all looks the same. Everything looks the same. You don't know where to go, what you're going to do, where you're going to turn. You don't know what you're going to, and thank God you've got a couple people in your life that are in that thing with you, that decided to go through that struggle with you, that's, that's speaking the name of Jesus over your situation, that's speaking the name of Jesus over your circumstance, not telling you how bad you got it, but telling you how good God is through it. Amen? There's somebody on the sound of my voice today that needs to understand this. That God is bringing you through this trial for you to testify of the goodness and the graciousness and the delivering power of God on the other side of it. And as we begin to sing in just a moment, I'm going to pray. If you would like to come pray, we would love to pray with you. We would love to, to join up with you. If you don't got nobody in your fire today, I promise you, you come to this altar and you'll find a whole heap load of church people that will link up with you and begin to pray the prayer of prayer of, of agreement over you. They'll begin to worship with you. They'll begin to sing with you. They'll begin to walk through your fire with you and you'll come out on the other side. Amen. Lord Jesus, we love you today. Lord, we thank you today for your word. We thank you today for your power, for your miracle working power. And God, there's somebody on the sound of my voice that's going through a circumstance or a trial or a tribulation. God, I want you to reveal yourself to them. God is the fourth man in their fire. God, be with them today. Strengthen them today. Walk with them today. God, anoint them today. Cover them today like only you can. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Oh, now the power lives in me. There is another in the fire. Standing next to me. There is another in the water Holding back the sea Should I ever need reminding How you set me free There is a grave that holds no eyes Now the power lives in me There is another in the fire Oh
There is another in the water. He's holding back, holding him back the sea. Should I ever, Should I ever need reminded? The power set me free. There is a grave that holds no body. And now the power lives in me. I don't know how many times over the 20 years of ministry I've been in. I don't think I've ever saw this before. Y'all just, just got to bear with me. This is pretty cool for me. I told you that Nebuchadnezzar says, look, I see four men walking around the fire, unbound and unharmed. This is verse 25. And the fourth looks like a son of the God. In verse, in verse 26, the Bible says, Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace. He approached the opening of the blazing furnace. I thought the guards, when they approached the opening of the blazing furnace, they were consumed. Good Lord of mine. In verse 26, Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace. All of a sudden, the anointing that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had, the covering that he, they three had, was now being extended to the very one that wanted to destroy them. Because the very one that wanted to destroy them was about to make a decree about them and about their God. He said, then he approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. And the satraps, the perfects, the governors, the royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that their fire had not harmed their body, nor was a hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was not the smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar says in verse 28, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Verse 29, therefore I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their house be turned into piles of rubber for no other God can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Can I tell you that the very one that's speaking death over you that the very one that's speaking a curse over you, that the very one that's speaking a life full of, of torment and torture and a, and a fiery furnace over you, don't curse them back. Don't curse them back. The God is doing something that even you can't understand. Don't curse them back. Go through your fiery furnace experience. Go through it. And all of a sudden, the very one that sent you into the place is going to come to it and say, oh, oh, well, how are you still alive? And your anointing will begin to cover them. And they begin to make a decree about your God. That's how God's providence works in our lives. Do you understand that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego saved countless other Hebrews because of the decree that the king made because they refused to bow? You think it's just about you. 
you think it's just about me fighting my battle no 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 honey when you don't bow you help me when you refuse to capitulate you help me when you refuse to give in you help me when you refuse to compromise as a church you help this entire generation this nation this community we live in it is something powerful when you say we will not bow amen let's give the Lord another hand clap of praise thank you Pastor Justin So praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. Say praise, praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. I won't be quiet, I won't be quiet. of the Lord today. I don't know if you're like me, but I hear this and, and I think about them and I'm, and I'm like, you know, if I'm there with a few other guys, you know, and I'm hearing them say like, hey, Nebuchadnezzar, you can do whatever you want to to us, but even if, see, we're not going to bow down and I just kind of feel like I might have been there going, that's easy for you to say, I guess. I, are we, do, no, no, maybe, I don't, Okay, we're not. We're not doing this. But you know, I was just reminded by Jesus' words that all it takes is just the faith of a mustard seed. See, I don't know who we're talking to today. It's like, you know, I see this trial that I'm going through. I, I, I just, I see that it's hot and I don't like it and I don't want to walk through it. You know, I don't know if I have enough faith to get through it. But yeah. aren't you encouraged today that there is a fourth person in the fire with you? That should make somebody shout right there. I think it's okay. Aren't we glad? Just the size of a mustard seed is all somebody has. You just have that just fragment of faith this morning. You're going to leave out of here victorious. Aren't you thankful for that today? Amen. Thank you so much for joining us, whether you're here in person with us or you're joining us on live stream. We are delighted that you would yeah. choose this Lord's Day to spend with us and worship with us. Let's pray a prayer of dismissal. Lord God, we love you and thank you for the privilege that it is to come into your house and to worship you today. What a powerful message and reminder from Pastor Jason, Lord, that we don't need to conform and bow down to this world. Lord, if there is a young person right now under the burden of conformity, I just pray by your spirit to release the Lord that they do not bend a knee today, Lord. Lord, help us to remember as you said before, when you were on this planet, you told us that for anyone that hears you, and begins to walk out a faith in you, they are like 
building a house upon a firm foundation. Lord, so when those even if moments come their way, those storms of life come their way, that house is firm and sure because it's built on you. Lord, we want to leave here victorious knowing that you are indeed that fourth man in the fire with us today. Wrap your loving arms around someone today that is in the middle of that fiery furnace. Lord, and we'll be careful to give you the praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Men, let me tell you something you were about to leave. Don't go anywhere. I've got to tell you about men's love. It's back. I thought that was going to be a lot more wow kind of moment there. I'm sorry. I just, it's going to be back. Men's Woo! lunch is coming. Kent Fried Chicken, y'all aren't excited about that? I was really psyched about that. Woo! I was really psyched about that. It's only 12 bucks. That's not bad. We ought to get excited. Look, it's coming up. I need you to do something for me, though. You need to invite someone. You need to bring them with you. You need to sign up first. Because we ain't going to cook chicken we don't need. So sign up. You can sign up online or there in the cafe next Sunday. The cafe's closed after service, but next Sunday you swing by the cafe and we'll get you taken care of. Love y'all. Thank y'all. We'll see you next time. God Christmas bless. Christmas auditions at 3.30, K through 7s.